Hi folks, Greg Reverio here from Pilot Institute. This is another video in what is actually becoming a mini series when I didn't really want it to become a mini series. But um, in this video, I want to talk about visual line of sight. And the last couple of videos that we've posted on similar topics kind of explain the parts of the regulation that are difficult to understand. We talked about the rules of 44809, how to fly as a recreational flyer. We talked about how high can you fly with your drone and the 400 foot limit, which is really not a 400 foot limit because in some places you can fly higher and some places you can fly lower. And so in this video, I want to talk about visual line of sight. This comes from the fact that we get a lot of comments, a lot of, of questions from our students, from potential students, from people on YouTube about, well, what is visual line of sight and how can I actually meet the requirements? So in this video, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about every requirement for recreational flyer, but I'm also going to talk about part 107 because the requirements are a little bit different and because they're confusing and also because the FA is around the corner about to make some changes, not really changes, but clarifications, I should say, uh, for recreational flyer. So let's get to it. As you may know already, the rules for recreational flying are contained in the US code 44809. And in 44809, under A3, there is a section that talks about visual line of sight. And if you read it, it's really three lines, very straightforward. I'm going to read it to you right now. It says the aircraft is flown within the visual line of sight of the person operating the aircraft or a visual observer co-located and in direct communication with the operator. There's a lot of keywords in here. The first keyword is visual line of sight. Visual line of sight is as really, there's no other way to describe it, right? You have a visual on the aircraft. Line of sight means that there is no object obstructing your vision as you're looking at your drone. So at all time, really, you should be able to see your drone. If you look up from your controller, you should be able to see where it is. Maybe you look down and get something in your bag, and then when you look back up, you should be able to see where it is. That's essentially what the rule is saying. Now, in here, there are some words that may be confusing sometimes. It says, the person operating the aircraft, this is probably you as you're watching this, or, and the or is sometimes confusing, a visual observer. Some people say, well, I don't really need to be able to see as long as my visual observer is over there and looking at the drone. Well, is that's not really the truth. The visual observer must be co-located and in direct communication with the operator. So this means that your visual observer should be really near to you in direct communication. And that's it. This is all that 44809 says. Now, if we start digging a little bit for more information, we can go into the advisory circular. As I'm recording this, the current advisory circular is called 9157 Bravo. If you don't know what an advisory circular is, it's a document published by the FAA. They have hundreds of them for all different types of topics. And these advisory circulars provide additional information about a topic that may be confusing. Well, this is perfect because this is always confusing to people. Now, AC 9157 Bravo does not contain only information about line of sight. It contains information about flying your drone for recreational purposes. It explains what 44809 is with more words than are in the regulation. But, I need to mention, advisory circulars are not regulation, they're guidance, they're advisory by nature, okay? So whatever is in here does not necessarily mean it's the actual regulation, it's just an explanation. It's kind of like a, a get in the brain of the FA type of things. But in here it says, this means that either the recreational flyer or the visual observer must have eyes on the aircraft at all time to ensure that there is no uh, collision hazard or there's no other aircraft or people on the ground. That's basically what this means in here. Now the or, again, is kind of important in here. It means that either you or your visual observer should be able to see the aircraft um, at all time. Okay, should have your eyes in there. It also says in here, the assistance of a visual observer is generally optional, this is good, but is helpful in ensuring the recreational flyer is able to check instruments for an extended period of time. All right. Another thing that it says in here, the assistance of a visual observer is necessary, okay, necessary if the recreational flyer wants to use first person view devices that allow a limited view of the surrounding area. If you're flying FPV, advisory circular says you need to have a visual observer. 
Now, as far as the co-located, here's a bit more information. It says visual observer need to be co-located with the recreational flyer and able to communicate directly with the recreational flyer without the use of technological assistance. This is what it says in here. All right, that's the guidance in the advisory circular. The FA just recently, a couple days ago from me recording this video in July of 2021, it says there's new guidance coming in 9157. Charlie, that's the new version of the advisory circular. Now, what did they add in here? It says that the vision must be unaided by any devices other than corrective lenses. This is actually language that we see in part 107. So they took that, they added it to the advisory circular. So now when you look at your drone, you can be using binoculars to do it. They also added information about the co-located thing. And they said they must be standing close enough to the recreational flyer to be able to communicate directly with him or her without the use of technological assistance and without creating a distraction to the recreational flyer. So that's somewhat of a new guidance in here. Now you're going to say, uh, there are some questions that I hear all the time. It says, can you position or can I position a visual observer a mile down the road so that I can fly long distance, so I can fly much further? And the answer is no. The VO must be co-located, okay? And you can use a walkie-talkie, you can use any of this. Now remember, this is only for recreational flying. This is only for recreational flying. Um, how come the FA didn't specify a specific distance for visual line of sight? A lot of people ask me that question. And it really depends on the size of the drone. You know, I have large drones right here in the studio. We have smaller drones. Um, it really depends. It depends on your visual acuity as well. It depends on the condition. If it's if it's foggy, a little bit foggy, or lower visibility, then you may not be able to see it as far. So with all that being said, that's why the FA didn't want to limit a specific distance. And the other question that I get from people all the time is, why can't I use the camera to meet VLOS requirement, visual line of sight requirement? For example, my camera, I can see exactly what's going on, maybe at an angle of, I don't know, 170 degrees, maybe a little bit less, probably 130, 140 degrees of visual uh, field of view. Well, the FAA says that unlike somebody sitting in an airplane that can look around and turn their heads very quickly and look back, you can't do that with a drone. So that's the reason why you have to stay within visual line of sight because you, you don't have the ability to look around for other traffic and you may not see an aircraft that's coming directly at 90 degrees this way and, and hit you. So that's the reason why we have this kind of ruling. Now, another question that I get for recreational flyer, remember we're only talking about recreational flyers, is uh, can I waive this? Can we get a waiver so I can fly beyond visual line of sight? And the answer is no. Uh, there's no waiver process available for recreational flyer that is only available under part 107. So remember, if you're flying for recreational purposes, then you need to make sure that your VO, if you're using one, is co-located near you, okay? If you're using FPV, you have to use a VO, and at all time, you have to be able to lift the goggles and be able to see what is going on and, uh, and be able to see the aircraft. If you're flying by yourself, then you need to, at all time, maintain visual line of sight, and you need to be able to see the drone in the area um, anytime that you look up. That's the bottom line, all right? Let's move on to part 107, because under part 107, the rules are a little bit more specific. The requirement for visual line of sight in part 107 is in 107.31. That's the, uh, the, the chapter, if you want to call it that. Uh, and it's divided into really three main sections, the what, the how, and the who. Now, I can tell you, this is probably the most confusing piece of regulation in part 107 for people to understand. And the reason is because the FA uses an or and an and in two different places in the regulation and people get confused about it. So I'm going to try to clear that up. Let's talk about the first part, which is the what. The what is contained in uh, subsection A in 107.31. It says, with vision that is unaided by any device other than corrective lenses. Does that sound familiar? 44809, it's the same thing. The remote pilot in command, the visual observer, and I'm going to emphasize on the end, and the person manipulating the flight controls of the small unmanned aircraft system must be able to see the unmanned aircraft throughout the entire flight. The visual observer, the
the remote pilot in command and the person manipulating the flight controls. You're gonna say, isn't the remote pilot in command the same person that's manipulating the flight controls? Not necessarily, you can actually supervise someone to do it. So in most cases, yes, it is the same person, but the end is very important in here because it says that all three of these people or two of these people, if there's only two, must be able to see the unmanned aircraft throughout the entire flight. So right here, what that prevents you from doing is having a VO that is two miles down the road where you send the aircraft and all of a sudden you can't see it, but the VO can see it. That doesn't work because in here, in the first segment, it says everybody must be able to see the drone at all time during the entire flight. All right, now that's the what. Let's take a look at the how, which is in the same section, but what is visual line of sight? It wasn't defined in 44809, but in here it is defined as four different things. There are four things that you need to do in order to meet visual line of sight. You have to know the unmanned aircraft location. Okay, well, that's looking at it and seeing where it is. You have to determine the unmanned aircraft attitude, altitude, and the direction of flight by looking at the drone. You need to observe the airspace for other aircraft or hazard, and you need to determine that the unmanned aircraft does not endanger the life and property or property of another. Number two, right here, determine the aircraft attitude, altitude, and direction of flight. This is where most people think that, hey, a tiny little dot, a tiny little speck on the horizon is good enough. It's not, because you are not able to determine the attitude of the aircraft or the direction of flight in most cases, okay? So keep that in mind. Those are the four things, that's the how. The last thing that we need to look at is the who. And this is the part that's confusing to people because, let me read it, that's B. B, it says, throughout the entire flight of the, unmanned, the small unmanned aircraft, the ability described in subparagraph A, that's what we just mentioned, of this section must be exercised, and I put exercise in capital letters here, by either the remote pattern command or the person manipulating the flight controls or a visual observer. So you're probably scratching your head by now. Why is there an or in here at this stage when there was an end before? Well, look at what it says, exercise, exercise. Everything that we said, the ability to see the aircraft must be exercised by one of these two people at all time, the remote pilot in command or the visual observer. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. You're flying FPV. You're flying FPV and you have a visual observer with you and that visual observer has the ability to see the drone at all time. That's the or. You're not able to see the drone at all time because you're under the goggles. So the or allows you to be flying the drone yourself and have the, re the, the remote pilot have the ability to see it. You can say, well, what about the first part in the, the end? Well, the first part in the end is very simple. You as the pilot, if you remove the goggles, you should be able to see the drone as soon as you remove the goggles. That meets the requirement of the end, okay? What the FA is not saying, the FA is not saying that the remote pilot and the visual observer must look at the aircraft at all time. They must have the ability to see the aircraft at all time. Big difference. They're basically saying that as long as one of you two can see the aircraft is good, but at all time, you must be able to see it if you look for it. Do you understand the difference here? That, that, is, that is the whole part about this regulation that is confusing. They, they made it so that if they hadn't written it this way, if they had an and and an and in both statements, then essentially you couldn't fly FPV because it would mean that the FPV pilot would have to be able to see the drone at all time and the visual observer as well. What it's saying is that if you're flying FPV and you lift the goggles up, you gotta be able to see where the drone is and your visual observer has gotta have his, his or her eyes on that drone at all time. Okay, I hope this clarifies it because this is a question I get all the time. It's very difficult to explain in text. So I, I, I made this video because I'm hoping this can help uh, people understand what is going on. But that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line with 10731. Yes, there's an and, yes, there's an or. You have to consider both statements together. If you're a coder and then you, you write code for computers, you understand the, the or and the end statement. That's exactly what it is. So you, you have to keep that in mind uh, when you go flying. Now, can you get a waiver for all of this? Yes, you can. 10731 is one of the waivable regulation in part 107. You have to go to the FAA drone zone, you have to submit the paperwork, and then you'll get 
get a waiver. Now, this is a lot harder than me just saying it like that, okay? Getting a waiver to fly beyond visual line of sight is not 100% easy. Uh, it's possible, people have it, but it's gonna take a lot of paperwork because you're gonna have to prove that you can see inside a drone from all over places or that you have sensors that will avoid uh, um, another aircraft from hitting you, for example. So you, you gotta have your eyes in the sky one way or another. Okay. Any questions, leave them in the comments. I'm sure there's gonna be quite a few, but this is an important topic because it's, uh, well, it's often discussed. It's very, it's not always very well understood. So I'm hoping that this clarifies it. Like, subscribe, do everything that you do and uh, fly safe. And I'll see you guys for the next video.